Hi folks, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Today I want to take a look at a paper back from 2003. And this paper takes a look at the technology behind the Transmeta architecture. Now, if you don't remember, Transmeta was a company that back in the early 2000s built a processor that was compatible with the x86 instruction set so it could execute and run x86 operating systems and x86 programs, but it did so at a much lower power consumption than the Intel and AMD chips of the time. And the way they did that was via some really interesting architectural decisions. Now, the company and the products didn't end up succeeding in the market, but I still think that some of the architectural and design choices that they made were really interesting and they're worth talking about. And as you'll see, some of them just happened to be way ahead of their time. So at the chip level, their microprocessor, which they call Crusoe, was a very large instruction width processor, VLIW processor. So each instruction word actually could consist of, I think it was up to four smaller instructions. Each of these larger instructions was called a molecule and each of the smaller instructions within it were called atom. But on top of this VLIW microprocessor, which itself was not x86 compatible, they had a software layer which they called code morphing software. And this software layer took in x86 code and translated it at runtime to the instruction set executed by this VLIW microprocessor. So in effect, this is a binary translation system. And there has been a lot of work in this area. I covered a paper on a system called Dynamo earlier on this channel. But the main difference in this case is that this is a system level translator. This is not just translating an application at a time. This is translating the entire system, including the operating system. So it has nothing to fall back on. It does not have any OS level support or system call level support. It has to support the OS and everything else on top of the instruction set. So this means it has to support the full range of all the idiosyncrasies of x86 code out in the wild. Now that begs the question, why would you even want to do this? And the main motivation was lower power consumption, which in turn led to longer battery life in notebooks and laptops. The idea was that the VLIW microprocessor could be made simpler than the x86 and AMD chips at the time. And hence, it would have a smaller die size, it would consume lesser power. And then since you are handling all the translation in software in this code morphing layer, you could actually change the underlying architecture as time went on. And in fact, they did this. They came out with two different versions of the Crusoe processor. Most of this paper is going to be about all the special things they did in order to deal with the vast range of crazy x86 code out there with all its corner cases, exceptions, interrupts, self-modifying code, and so on. If you look at the high-level architecture of the code morphing layer, it is very similar to other binary translation systems in that it starts off by interpreting the incoming x86 instruction. This allows you to start executing them right away. Of course, interpretation itself is slow, even though it lets you get faster startup. So in the steady state, as you accumulate a bunch of instructions that are executed frequently, you translate that group of instructions into the instruction set of the underlying Crusoe processor and you store that translation in a cache. And the next time you see the same group of instructions, you can execute them right away from the cache without incurring any translation overhead. 
Now this translator can do a lot of optimizations on the code. The group of instructions it looks at could be pretty large. It's larger than a basic block. So it can have loops, it can have branches and so on, uh, which means it can do all the standard data flow optimizations, constant folding, loop rolling, unrolling, constant propagation and so on that a regular compiler does on that bunch of instructions. The next most important thing is that if you encounter some sort of an exceptional circumstance, if you encounter some sort of a fault, you could actually roll back execution and fall back to interpretation. So in order to get good performance, it is important for this translator to do some sort of speculative execution. What do we mean by speculation? It means making and exploiting assumptions that at the time of translation you are not sure will hold. And you make those assumptions so that you can generate efficient and faster code. But what happens if one of those assumptions is broken when the code actually runs? You don't want those incorrect results from that code. And so what you have to do is somehow at runtime check whether those assumptions are broken and if those assumptions are broken then fall back or roll back in some sense. Now in this case since one company is designing both the hardware the Crusoe microprocessor as well as the software which is the code morphing layer they can design it in a way such that the hardware and software work together to communicate back and forth when these assumptions fail. Basically when one of the speculative assumptions fail you fall back to interpreting that code and when you interpret code you execute it with strict x86 semantics. One of the hardware mechanisms that they support for speculative execution and then efficient rollback is what they call shadow registers. This means that all registers that hold x86 state actually have two copies, a working copy and a shadow copy. The regular flow of instructions only updates the working copy of the register and if execution reaches the end of a group of instructions without violating any speculative assumptions then these working copies are committed but if one of the speculative assumptions is broken then you simply don't commit these working copies and fall back to interpretation this general mechanism of falling back to interpretation as a form of rollback is something that they use a lot. Another area they use this is in precise exceptions. Now in the x86 instruction set, exceptions are precise in the sense that if a specific instruction causes an exception, all the instructions before that must complete their execution. Now this means that you have to undo a lot of that execution if in the code morphing software you have performed some reordering and out of order execution in order to get more efficiency. The same general principle also applies to interrupts. Another interesting area is memory mapped IO. The problem is that at runtime you cannot tell which memory accesses are translating to reads and writes out on physical devices versus just regular memory reads and writes. And in order to deal with memory mapped I.O., you don't want to completely turn off memory reordering because that is a really important optimization that the code morphing software can make. So to track that, what they're doing is when instructions are reordered from their original x86 program, they track that they have been reordered. When such a reordered memory access maps to IO space rather than memory space, the hardware raises an exception and then you fall back to a previously committed state and start interpreting those instructions. The same general idea holds for data speculation. Even if you look at memory operations that don't touch IO space, not always can you prove that load and store instructions that you have reordered do not overlap. Now in practice, they rarely do overlap. And so you do want to reorder to get faster and more efficient execution. But again, if the hardware detects a violation of this assumption, it raises an exception, 
and then you fall back to interpreting those instructions with strict x86 semantic. Now, like I said, a lot of this seems like it was way ahead of its time. A lot of these ideas have since been incorporated into more modern architectures. Of course, modern architectures do a ton of speculative execution, a ton of reordering in silicon itself. Many new architectures even have built-in support for transactional memory. Another really crazy corner case that they had to deal with was self-modifying code. Apparently, there's a lot of x86 code out there in the wild that modifies itself while executing. And I don't want to get into all the nitty-gritty details over there. I'd encourage you to read the paper if you're interested in that. But they had to take a lot of special measures to deal with self-modifying code in the code morphing layer. So that was a quick look at the Transmeta code morphing system, which built a complete x86 compatible system on a very simple low power VLIW microarchitecture combined with a binary translation system on top that offered an x86 compatible ISA2 software running on top of it. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.